Thank you for joining everyone. I am happy to have so many people online. Because this is a product specific uh, kind of a topic in terms of licensing and costing, I just want to make it clear that I don't sell Microsoft or any other software for that matter. And whether you purchase it or not, I don't get any direct or indirect benefit. My expertise lies in using the products, not in purchasing and pricing. So please check everything which I say with your partner or the vendor. So what is Office 365? In fact, we saw it in a little more detail yesterday, but just a recap. It contains a lot of products. In addition to all these products, it contains administrative security and compliance tools as well, which we have not discussed because these webcasts are more focused on the business side of things. But when we actually talk about what editions or versions are available for purchase, then it becomes really confusing. As you can see, there is a plethora of different SKUs and different jargon, and it becomes really confusing even for seasoned professionals in large corporates. So I plan to demystify all this as well as I can. The first question is why do we need so many editions? And the answer is simple because Office is used by 1.2 or something like that billion people. The exact number I don't know, but it's a very large number. So practically one in seven human being uses Office. So obviously there are different types of businesses and people. So the target audiences are home, obviously, individual students and academic institutions where the students are actually studying and then smaller businesses and large companies. Of course, there is one more category called government, which I am intentionally keeping out because that pricing and SKUs are completely different and I'm not targeting that segment right now. Let's talk about Office because that's something we all can relate to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Access, Publisher also in case someone is using it. It's a nice tool, but unfortunately it doesn't get the attention it deserves. Never mind. So there are two types of things. One is um, you buy an Office like we used to do in older days, get a floppy or CD, DVD, whatever, install it physically. That's called the on-premise version. That's a one-time purchase. Once you purchase that, you use it for life. You don't have to pay Microsoft ever again. Of course, it will have a potential upgrade after three years, but for that you'll have to pay again, whatever is the incremental price. There will be security patches coming every month. Now there is a different version called Office Pro Plus, which is also called Office 365 Pro Plus, which is not purchased one time. It is a monthly subscription. For some reason, there are two editions. One is business, one is enterprise. Now primary difference in those is number of users you can purchase in business queue and enterprise. Enterprise has no limit on number of users you can purchase. In business, it is maximum 300 users you can purchase. But still, what is the difference between the on-premise and the cloud version? You get one drive, which is one terabyte of space, and you get ability to install this on multiple devices. Office is also available as a part of home SKU, as we will see. There is little difference between pricing. I really don't know why there is a difference. Probably you can clarify it with your partner or Microsoft. I tried to find the reason I could not. But bottom line, there are two types. One is something which we install locally and one is which comes from cloud and gets installed and updated. The primary difference between these is the cloud one is what is called as cloud connected, means it's more integrated with all the other parts of Office 365. It also gets more frequent updates. If you configure it, it can even update every week. So what was earlier a three year frequency of updates has now reduced to one week. I'm not suggesting you do it at weekly interval, but for most users, you should keep the refresh frequency to one month and IT people should be live in the sense it's called Office Insider, where you get the updates as early as possible so that you can test them before it is released on a larger scale. 
there are a lot of AI features because artificial intelligence is not just programming. It requires a lot of data. It requires a lot of training and it requires huge amount of infrastructure to cater to the world. These features are part of office but the features themselves have to run on a very sophisticated and complex infrastructure which cannot be put on a desktop. That is why we uh, call them cloud connected features. I don't have time to show you all the demos of all this. In fact, from tomorrow we are going to go into individual products. So one of the topics I will ensure is all these are covered in the individual product sessions we do from tomorrow onwards. The bottom line is all these features require cloud and AI and those features will not be available on the on premise or the desktop version of the Pi. So if you really compare, there are a lot of SKUs. For example, this is home personal student. Somewhere it is given as yearly, someone it is given as monthly, but you can do the math. Needless to say for academic institutions is the cheapest. And in fact, if an academic institution, a college or a school or an university purchases license of office, all the students who are studying there get the A3 version for free while they are students. And this is something which many educational institutes as well as students don't know. Now, even if your college is not a part of this, it's absolutely worth going for the home and student edition. It costs some few hundred rupees a month and it allows you to install it on six PCs. You get six terabyte of storage and it gives you all the products which we just saw in that Office 365 slide. So it's a really good investment. It costs probably like having two pizzas, but it gives you all the value. Now I'm not going to go to details of what each of them does, but I will tell you where the differences in pricing come from. So depending on which component of this gamut is included or not included, the pricing changes. So office on desktop obviously is one of the key components of price. Number of installs, for example, the personal edition in home allows you to install on one PC, but almost all other editions allow you to install on five PCs and that is commonly not known. So if you have five or six installs, that means you're getting six different PCs or Macs where you can parallelly install it in the same cost. Very rarely known. Similarly, number of users. Business email means what? Essentials gives you just Outlook. It doesn't give you the Exchange server. Business, premium and enterprise will give you Exchange server, which is really the best email server in the world for decades. Mailbox storage also differs. The F1 SKU will have more probably 20 GB and the largest SKU will have 100 GB mailbox storage. OneDrive is practically there in almost all of them, but if F1, which is for frontline workers, frontline workers means people who are probably on your retail or they are door to door salesmen, feet on street, those kind of people, then it is only 2 GB and the higher SKUs will have one terabyte of space. And now for enterprise customers, if your one terabyte per user is full, you can actually request Microsoft. They will even upgrade it to, I think up to five terabyte, if I'm not mistaken, at no extra cost. Then of course, Teams now is available in across the board and especially coronavirus has made it even simpler to get Teams for free almost. Security and compliance are very important for enterprises more than other SKUs, so they have their own segments. So just to demystify things, now that we know different components, F1 gives you all the products on browser only, does not give you large amount of OneDrive, only 2 GB of space. Even again, less OneDrive, all products on browser, no Office on desktop. E3 gives you everything of even plus Office and some security features. And E5 gives you everything in E3 plus Power BI, which is a very powerful analytics tool, definitely good for businesses and very extensive amount of security. I don't have time to talk about details of security, but two very critical things which are big security problems 
viruses come through attachments and infected links. So it gives you two very powerful features, three rather safe links, safe attachments and phishing protection. So safe links means even if it's an infected link, if you click on it, you will not be harmed. Safe attachment means even if there is a virus in the file, it will not harm you. And phishing is very important, which is a very good level of protection across the enterprise using E5. Now, another common mistake people do is they don't look at the service description. Just comparison charts are not enough. Go to office service description that gives you much more detailed view of exactly what is included and the service level agreements. All people who are interested in the purchase and evaluation must see service description. So go to docs.microsoft.com office or M365 service description. So now all this is Office 365, but that's not all. All this has to run somewhere, so we need Windows. So now Windows can also be bundled with it. And all this needs to be protected. We are not protecting really the operating system or the devices, we are protecting data. So for that, whether the data is on Windows, it is on device, it is on network, on cloud, you need enterprise level security, that is EMS, enterprise mobility and security. And all these three put together is called Microsoft 365. And that also has queues at business level. It is almost double, but gives you top class, world class security. And enterprise level again, we have three levels, but the pricing is not on the web page publicly available that you have to talk to Microsoft or a partner to understand that. But the concept remains the same. E3 will contain Office plus security and E5 will contain even more additional security plus Windows. Now coming to what do you need? If you attended yesterday's session, you will know that these are the common needs we have and these needs can be at individual team or company level. All this creation, storage, protection, there are hundreds of vendors who create products for these. It's not that Microsoft is the only one, but what we don't want is 20 products from 20 vendors and waste time integrating them. What we want is something which is integrated by design and that is why all those products fit in and gives you a better return on investment. But how do you evaluate? Most of the needs which I showed are looking fairly common, but of course it's not so simple. Your organization, your culture, your processes, your industry, they are all very, very specialized. So how do you evaluate exactly what you need? Before I tell you that, I'll tell you how not to evaluate. These are the common pitfalls, how we typically do it superficially. Most of us are interested in just saving costs by going from on-premise to cloud. As long as there is some saving, we are OK. Nobody really checks the return on investment. And I would say the worst of all two of them, actually, it's IT driven evaluation. Office is an end user product. IT may purchase it, but users are going to use it. So users should be a part of it. And typically IT people are interested in product A versus product B and some kind of tick mark based evaluation that just doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? I will explain. Now it looks like some tangential thought, but it is not. In order to evaluate correctly, you need to understand the simple ground level rule of what is called a technology. It's a very simple concept. If it's a new technology, it should improve something which already happens or it should create some new capability which is useful to your business. It can be a combination of the two as well. If both of them are missing, then don't buy it. It's useless. Now, what is the objective of any kind of work we do, whether personal as a student or as a company or even as a government, I would say we want to grow in a personal life as well as corporate life. But growth cannot just happen in isolation. You also sometimes need to struggle and survive. I don't have to tell you all of us are now rethinking our lives because of the virus. But even if there are growth phases or survival phases, there is always some kind of compulsion. There will be government rules, there will be industry rules, there will be regulations which we have to follow. So we have to mix and match all these three in an efficient manner. So in order to do that effectively, you are using technology. 
to improve what is happening and get new capability. So this is the right way to evaluate. This is the right way to do a pilot before you purchase anything. I am doing this in the context of office, but of course this can be applied to any technology with few changes. I'm not going to really tell you individual steps. You're smart enough to figure it out, but I would say the most important part is it should be driven by a business head, not just IT and users should be involved in it and we have to learn all the new capabilities and map them to your needs. Otherwise what happens? I have seen it thousands of times and probably every customer suffers from this. They purchase the platform but use a very small fraction of it, guaranteeing poor ROI, poor adoption and no significant benefits. How exactly to do it? I have already written few blog articles. You may be interested in looking at them. So the first one is about Office 365 evaluation. Second one is Microsoft 365 evaluation and third one is Power BI evaluation. If you want more, of course you can post questions and the feedback I can post more as well. So I guess that's all the time we have. This is my blog by the way. Thank you for attending. Uh, it was a pleasure addressing all of you. And uh, this is the schedule from tomorrow. First two were sort of introductory overall sessions and now we will go deeper into each product. From tomorrow onwards, it will still be the same format, 15 minutes followed by Q&A, but if required, if you want or if I feel like, after that Q&A, I may continue the session in case I want to show you some in-depth features. Let me know if that idea suits you. So enjoy and be safe. Now I'll formally end this session and then if there are any questions, we can take those questions now. My company has Office 365 subscription and each person has been allowed to use or install it on 15 devices. Is that a security issue? Now I really doubt whether 15 devices. Let me explain what 15 devices means. Five PCs or Macs, that is five devices, five tablets, which is five more and five mobile devices. That is the theoretical limit. Of course, you can practically install it as well, but in real life, a given user is unlikely to have 15 devices. If they have, uh, having things installed on so many devices is I wouldn't see a security issue. Per se, it's a manageability issue because I'll myself lose track of what am I doing where. Having said that, if you have configured your conditional access policy in Azure AD properly, then having more devices by itself does not make it insecure. So what is conditional policy? It allows you not just to log in. Ideally, all of you should have two factor authentication minimum because that's uh, life has become so vulnerable for uh, various reasons. On top of that, if it's a device which is outside the network, it can have a different security applied. If it's a new device I purchase, it can have a different level of security. If I'm using a laptop which is not enrolled, then I can use a different level of security. So as long as Azure AD based security and endpoint protection is properly managed, just having extra devices by itself is not really a security risk. OK, we have one more question. Rahul Desai is asking. If you purchase Office 365 personal or home use, on the same desktop with multiple logins. Yes, yes, you can have a personal logon as well as a enterprise logon on the same device, for example, a desktop. Going one step further, let's say you have OneDrive and your personal OneDrive and you have a corporate OneDrive. Obviously on the mobile, OneDrive app is a single app, so you can have personal and multiple accounts of personal, multiple accounts of enterprise or business on same apps. And depending on the kind of security your IT has enabled, suppose I have a file in corporate OneDrive and I have personal OneDrive on the same app, I can't copy paste. So that you have to configure in endpoint protection. Either you do mobile device management, which is more restrictive, but nowadays people do mobile application management. So only the applications which are provided for by corporates are controlled. Your personal applications are not touched. So yes, absolutely possible. 
What is the difference between Office 365 and Microsoft Office? Good question. Let me actually. Uh, is my screen still visible, Anindu? So. Let me show you a slide just to explain what this means. So when we say Office, we are talking about what happens on desktop, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote. That is the desktop version. That is Office by itself, what we traditionally called Microsoft Office. If you have all those on desktop with all these other components, then it is called Office 365. So Office 365 is Office plus OneDrive plus Teams plus Stream and all of the others which you are seeing. All right, let's. Power BI is absolutely available for personal edition. I would strongly suggest anybody, whether you have Office 365 or not, doesn't really matter. Just go to powerbi.microsoft.com, log in using whatever ID you have, and then download Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop allows you to import data, clean it up, create dashboards. The only thing it does not allow you to do is publish on the Power BI portal. That is where Microsoft will ask you for money, but Power BI Desktop by itself is an extremely powerful tool. You should 100% explore it. It's phenomenal and unbelievable amount of not just dash, uh, analytics and interactive dashboards, but it also completely changes the way you import and clean up data. So explore Power BI. Yes, free version is really powerful. It even gives you 120 connectors which are free. And when I say Power BI Desktop is free, it is not a time limited version and it is not restricting any features except for publishing and sharing. Sharing a published dashboard is where you have to pay for Power BI Pro, which is just $9, which is, I don't know, 700 bucks, which is again like having a meal somewhere. All right, All right. lots of questions, nice. Chinmay Patil, how are you, man? Can we install on multiple devices? Yes. Does it mean multiple employees? No. It generally means if I have a laptop and a desktop and a home PC, I can install or use the same license on multiple PCs. Some bosses have one PC at home, one desktop and one laptop as well. There also it works. But the limitation is that's not really like if I have 50 people, I will buy 10 licenses and just use one license on five devices because to log in, you need an email ID. So if physically there are five people, you will need five email IDs. So it's not a license saving methodology. It doesn't work. But yes, multiple devices, absolutely. How will we use browser office when internet is being bad? Yes. So browser version of Office essentially requires internet connection. There is no offline version of Office online. Offline version of Office is Office, which has been there from day one. Now, another common question which I probably nobody has asked, but let me explain. If you have older versions of Office and only Office 365 E1, which does not include the new version of Office, many customers are trying to do that. It works partially, but the integration between Office and OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint, Stream is completely missing. So you are ending up locally saving files and uploading them, creating multiple copies and increasing your workload and increasing your instability. So instead of improving efficiency, you are wasting more time. So no browser offline edition. Why E365 doesn't have Visio and <laughs> projects? Sorry, those are two different products, and Microsoft has traditionally, from 30 years, they have not mixed those products, and I don't see that happening. Why they are not bundling it? Uh, I am not the right person to answer, but uh, for whatever reason, business or technical, they have not done it. But having said that, both of them have Office 365 editions now, so you can buy project 
Pro separately, or you can buy it as a part of Project Online, which is a preferred method because it gives you Project Server, which is pre-integrated with everything in Office 365. Similarly, Visio can be bought on premise like the Office on premise version 2019, but again there is a Visio Online version which allows you co-authoring and so on. So although they are not bundled with Office 365, they are integrated with Office 365. And I think subscription model is cheaper than one time purchase. On my personal PC, is it possible to access OneDrive by all who log in? No. OK, so on personal PC, you will log in as different users. So whoever is the user logged in, they have to log in to OneDrive for the first time. So if you have logged in using your personal outlook.com or corporate ID, and let's say your son or daughter or husband or wife logs in using a different profile. They will have OneDrive logo there, OneDrive icon there, but they will have to log in using their ID. If you are sharing your login password with others, then of course it's a different matter. Everyone can do everything. OK, another question is browser version as capable of desktop versions? <laughs> Absolutely not. Desktop version is the most powerful, so like I mentioned yesterday, if you have Office 365 and you open a document, you can open it on browser or you can open it on full version. Browser does not have all the features. The question is why does it not have? Because browser is also written by Microsoft. The web server is written by Microsoft. Office is written by Microsoft. Windows is written by Microsoft. In fact, the language in which all these tools are written are also written by Microsoft, which is C++. So why can't Microsoft give all the features which are on desktop on browser? There is one problem. Microsoft has no control over one component called HTML. That is managed by a worldwide consortium of many companies. Microsoft is a part of it, but when anything is standards based and consortium based, it is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing because everything is standardized. Bad thing is it is slow. So when HTML improves, Microsoft will add as many features as they can. In fact, they do. In fact, just two days back, they added a feature on browser. If you go to Office Insider, you will know all the capabilities. So Microsoft is closely monitoring evolution of HTML. They're trying to influence it also as much as they can, but in near future is not going to come anywhere near desktop because desktop is also improving by leaps and bounds. So bottom line, if you want quick and easy editing, large documents do it on browser. If you want extensive editing, all the features use desktop version. All right. So Arindo, have I covered all or Nick, is Nick, there anything I missed? I think there's one question you've missed. How practical is it to have at least some users use only the web based office apps? How capable slash compatible are they? Yeah, so uh, compatibility is concerned is absolutely guaranteed. So there may be some features which a desktop version has and browser version doesn't have. For example, in uh, Word, if you track changes, then track changes are not yet implemented on browser. That is coming, but as of now it is not. So if that is the case, then those features, if a particular file has browser editing will not be possible and you will get a message saying a particular feature XYZ is not supported on browser and you will you, have to use some desktop version. Other than that, what most customers do is people who are a floating population like feet on street, remote users, retail frontline sales workers, people who come and go in shifts, part time workers, outsource workers who are not fully having skin in the game are given the E1 subscription, which gives you basically the browser edition. And uh, people who are more into the game or people who are full time employees are given the desktop version. That is how typically most people do. In fact, the F1 version is given to, which is even more limited in capabilities, also has browser edition. But the decision of how many to go on browser, how many to go on desktop is purely a commercial one, not a technical one. Browser edition will continue to have limited features compared to desktop. All right, 
So any of you, if I have not addressed your question fully, you can just add a, another question as a follow up. No uh, Kamlesh, Kamlesh has asked a follow up question. Are there any features in the browser based office which are not available in the desktop version? Uh, there are a few features, many of the AI based features first come on browser and eventually do land up in desktop version. I'll give you one example which is valid as of now. In PowerPoint, if you go to browser version, there is some something called presentation coach. That feature is not available on desktop version, even if you have Pro Plus Office. Like that, there are a few features, but very few, which are only on browser and not on PowerPoint. There is another feature which is going to come very soon. Probably it's called PowerPoint Live, which is again initially going to be introduced on browser and then eventually it will come. So typically what happens is in case of browser versions, there is no deployment cycle because Microsoft is just updating their uh, bits or their program or software on their data centers. Users or customers don't have to do anything. So whenever a new feature comes, especially if it is AI based, they first put it on browser version, test it out, smoothen it out, and then they update it on the desktop versions. And while we are talking about that, Microsoft may give you a new version, but most corporates make a mistake of putting the refresh frequency as six months, which is a bad idea because it's not only bug fixes and security patches, new features are getting added. So you should keep the refresh frequency to one month and then you will benefit from the cloud connectedness of this whole ecosystem. Great. This was good. Any more? Yeah, just scroll down to the very last question, please. Yeah, uh, Sunil. Hi, Sunil. <laughs> Hi. What healthy habits have you followed to be able to read without specs or reading glasses? I don't know. I do have reading glasses, but Somehow my vision seems to be improving lately. <laughs> no special measures I have taken in any form or shape. Anything you want to add? Anindo? ZS? So ZS and Shesham. ZS is my I'm son. Shesham is my long time colleague. They are also on the call. So any questions or comments, Zeus, uh, Shesham, Manindo? All good. I'm good, thanks. All right, so if no questions, uh, shall we close it for this event? We have one new question which has just come in. How do we know what's new in office? That's a very good question. So um, typically what happens is whenever there is an update and let me see if I can show you that if. So it may take a little while to synchronize the screen, but anyway, when you go to file menu and go to file accounts and you go to update options, there is what's new. That is one place where you can go to. Then it actually opens a pane on the right side. And it'll give you a long list of all the updates uh, in reverse chronological order. So the latest updates will appear here. And as you go down, it will give you more and more details. In fact, this is something which happened just March 20th. That is three days back. So Outlook Calendar has a new feature now. Like that, if you go down, it gives you here is another feature for PowerPoint. We know that now if you put a file on one drive, multiple people can edit it simultaneously. We know that. Now if I'm presenting a file and someone is editing it, I can actually get my presentation updated live even if someone is remotely updating it in a co-authoring mode. That was added recently. Of course, that may be good and bad. It may be dangerous. So there is a checkbox that keeps slides updated. Then you decide. And this is a slideshow level setting. Normal sync in co-authoring is independent of this checkbox. 
So like that. So what's new? That's the idea. And if you really want to know what's new very, very quickly, then I would suggest you enroll in something called Office Insider program. Go to Office Insider website and there there are instructions on how to do it. So you will get new updates typically once a week and you will get new features as soon as Microsoft releases them. And it of course gives you another set of view updates where you will see what is new. Thanks everyone for attending. Enjoy and keep washing hands. Bye bye.